Let us pray. Heavenly Father, keep me from ever doubting your protective care. Lord Jesus, we praise you for willingly giving up your life at the proper time for our salvation. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please turn to page 46 for the responsory that we will sing following the reading of the Gospel lesson. The text for our meditation is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the second chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. Please rise in Jesus' name. After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to Joseph in a dream. He said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, because Herod will search for the child in order to kill him. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod. This happened to fulfill what was spoken through the Lord, by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, he was furious. He issued orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in all the surrounding countryside from two years old and under. This was in keeping with the exact time he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. The angel said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were, were trying to kill the child are dead. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus, Herod's son, had succeeded his father as ruler in Judea, he was afraid to go there. Since he had been warned in a dream, he went to the region of Galilee. When he arrived there, he settled in a city called Nazareth. So what was spoken through the prophets was fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God be praised for his glad tidings. You may be seated. <clears throat> All right, did you think it was strange? Think about the lesson that we just heard, and then think about the hymn that we sang right before it. Oh, rejoice, ye Christians, loudly, with its refrain, Joy, O oh joy, beyond all gladness, Christ hath done away with sadness. Hence all sorrow and repining, for the sun of grace is shining. Seems almost a cruel irony to place that in juxtaposition to this gospel text with its sound of weeping and great mourning. No doubt aspects of this text are very terrifying. Herod, in his madness, is on display jealously seeking to destroy a competitor to his throne, a task that's so important to him that he's willing to commit infanticide on a grand scale for the purpose. But even this madness of Herod's serves the fulfillment of Scripture by Jesus. And this is what this all is demonstrating for us, that fulfillment comes in Jesus. And first, that fulfillment means that he takes our place. Matthew's Gospel stands out among the rest in his quotations of the Old Testament Scripture. In this pericope alone, there are three separate fulfillments of Scripture passages proving and demonstrating who Jesus is. And the first is, Out of Egypt I called my son. This citation is from Hosea 11, verse 1. The prophecies of Hosea, famously, are all about God's complaint against Israel for being unfaithful. And this citation comes in this context. When Israel was a child, he said, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. So this passage serves as a reminder to the people of God who they are and how badly they've fallen. They were bought by God with blood, the blood of the firstborn, the blood of the lambs. And his care followed them through the Red Sea and across the wilderness until they took possession of the promised land. 
But like an adulterous wife, Israel abandoned God again and again for false gods. That's in fact the illustration that the prophet Hosea uses. But now St. Matthew tells us that Jesus is the fulfillment of these words. This is the first place in his gospel that Jesus is called God's son. And it is in his office as the one who takes the place of Israel. That is, this son, Israel, whom God liberated from Egypt, rebelled against him. So in order to save his people, Jesus steps into their place, revealing himself to be the true and great son, fulfilling all others. Throughout the next chapters of the gospel, readers would see Jesus succeeding in multiple places where Israel failed, overcoming temptation, trusting in God, devoting his life to God's purpose. And thereby Jesus takes the place of God's chosen people, making satisfaction for them. So we say Jesus is the true Israel, the true Son of God. Think, for example, of the Ten Commandments. You shall, they say again and again, you shall. And God's people failed in each one. Neither Israel, nor you, or I, nor any other human being in history succeeded in God's proclamation on Mount Sinai. But look at how those words are fulfilled in Jesus. You shall, they say, and Jesus did. The second of three fulfilled Old Testament prophecies is this one. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they are no more. This is a moment of darkness in Israel's history. The death of the children in Bethlehem is a blight, a stain. It's a great horror that they experienced. The citation of this prophecy is from Jeremiah 31, verse 15, which speaks of the great sadness of the land of Judah when its inhabitants were in bondage in Babylon. But the very next verses go on to say, Thus says the Lord, Keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work, declares the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. Before explaining this further, I'd like to point out something about how Matthew introduces this prophecy. He usually will introduce an Old Testament citation by saying, this happens to fulfill what was spoken or so that it might be fulfilled. But for this one, it's far simpler. He simply writes, then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. Matthew avoids declaring that it was God's purpose that the children in Bethlehem die. As indeed he did not wish that they would die. But now look at how he uses this tragedy. People are crying for God's deliverance at this unspeakable act, and God's reply is already there among them. Now that God's plan has begun to be fulfilled in Jesus, even unthinkable evil, such as the murder of Bethlehem's children, can serve and become a part of what God is doing in and through Jesus. Martin Luther makes two almost contradictory comments on this gospel. First, he says, In this gospel, the Lord Christ is saved and preserved, showing us an example of fatherly compassion that God has for all of his own. And second, he says, God acts as if he isn't looking and lets Herod strike. Where is his fatherly care? The Christian in the world often appears poor and forsaken of God, despised and lost. But it's in precisely those humblest, direst, darkest of circumstances that God's grace and power shines. These babies who were killed in Bethlehem are considered among the first Christian martyrs, their blood pointing to the fulfillment of God's deliverance in Christ. And the gospel lesson for All Saints Day, which certainly includes these children among those saints, the section of Matthew's gospel known as the Beatitudes, which includes this one. Blessed are those who mourn, because they will be comforted. So in those darkest of circumstances, God shows his power to save. When the nation of Israel had not only failed to keep God's commands, but indeed they had become 
the same as their captors in Egypt with the murder of children, God's redemption was there. Among those babies, but the one who escaped now to sacrifice himself for them later. The blood of those babies was sanctified by the blood of the one who did not die then, but the one who lived in their place. And in your place, in my place. And then who died, shedding his holy and righteous blood to purchase our deliverance from sin into heaven. And then the third citation says, he will be called a Nazarene. This one's different from the other two because there is, in fact, no specific prophecy in the Old Testament that says this exactly. And Matthew even knows this. The way he introduces this prophecy is by saying what was spoken through the prophets was fulfilled. And by stating it this way, mentioning prophets instead of the prophet or naming any particular prophet, the apostle implies many different sources. And he intends to say that Jesus will be despised and rejected by many because he's not the kind of Christ that they are willing to receive. Some will, by grace, through faith, come to claim Jesus as Emmanuel and God with us, but others will only turn away, calling him the Nazarene, that man from that backwater town that nobody cares about. There are, in fact, many prophecies in the Old Testament pointing to how despised Jesus would be, and here again we have that theme of reversal. This Christ, the one who is crucified, is a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But this Christ is also to us the power of God and the wisdom of God. He's taken our place, you see. He was rejected so that we would be accepted into his heavenly kingdom. He was brought into the perfect place in the flesh so that we would have the salvation that he brought. And in his life, we see how he suffers so that we might have joy. As an infant, Jesus was taken into Egypt in flight from death. And that was ultimately his salvation because had he not fled, he might have been destroyed along with all the other children of Bethlehem. But this also signified his taking the place of Israel. And Israel, when they left Egypt, came out through the Red Sea. And St. Paul says of that crossing, they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. When Jesus emerged from Egypt, it was a foreshadowing of his emergence from the grave, from death. And now so we, when we are baptized, we cross that sea with him, we emerged from death into life through those waters. Just think of it, that he suffered death so that we sail on the ark of grace, his grace, on top of that water. He refused the wine and vinegar so that we might feast on his body and blood. He remained silent before his accusers so that we hear the loud proclamation of forgiveness. This was accomplished on the cross and fulfilled in the resurrection, but it began here with the Christ child. Jesus lived amidst our death from the very beginning, born in the humblest circumstances, surrounded by the most obvious display of sin-wrought death. It's clear what he came to accomplish. Our hymn sings of God's goodness that he has honored us in that he deigns to dwell with us. It also reminds us all he suffers for thy good to redeem thee by his blood. And the last two verses of the hymn include the prayer that we regularly be reminded of God's grace and that we to thee at all times cleave, that is, that we hold tightly to Jesus in faith. Well, how can we do this? Faith only comes by means of his word and his sacraments. We only receive Christ where he is to be found, in those means of grace. The events of our gospel occurred just after the Magi from the East left, and we'll hear that story on Wednesday night for Epiphany. But there's a key difference to be seen here between the true worshipers of Christ, those who go to him diligently with gifts, 
seeking his grace, and those who only want their own glory, like Herod, who prefer not what Jesus really offers, but what they want him to offer. And therefore hear Jesus, and know his truth, his comfort, and his grace, how he came to fulfill all things for your salvation, and receive it as he gives it my prayer, and I know that our Lord will answer it in each person's circumstances, whatever struggles, whatever blessings you face. My prayer is the final verse of the hymn, Jesus, guard and guide thy members. Fill thy brethren with thy grace. Hear their prayers in every place. Brighten now faith's glowing embers. Grant all Christians far and near holy peace and godly cheer. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forevermore. Amen.